Oh, good evening. We usually just rush into these things, but I, perhaps we ought to say who we are and what we do. This is the Libertarian Alliance, founded circa 1978, except all imitations. I believe there are some about. <laughs> the more the merrier. Um, this is one of our regular monthly meetings that we meet uh, to listen to a talk, and the talk tonight is being given by David McDonough, and his title is Money and Anarchy. And Anarchy. Please begin. All oh, right. So uh, I'd like to uh, open up with, uh, before I come, because this, basically this talk is about Hayek's pamphlet, The Denationalisation of Money. So, uh, denationalisation of money that he actually brought out as a, an earlier pamphlet, a revision of an e uh, earlier pamphlet uh, which was uh, Choice in Currency and uh, so that's basically what it talks about now uh, I'm also going to cover to this, uh, a lesser degree uh, a fellow called Rigel who uh, died in uh, the early 1950s and uh, who uh, Put forward a system of uh, privatisation money, of money. Um, in fact, I've got in the book here, which uh, there might be some books that I might recommend you to. I recommend you, by the by, to all these books that I'm going to show you. I also recommend you to read. Uh, uh, yeah, the denationalisation of money. This is uh, Rigel, a new approach to freedom, um, which I'm also going to cover. I've read it. But, but, but you've read it, yes, a page turner. Yeah, oh, it's, it's good. Um, free, uh, Hayek refers to it, uh, and he, he, he refers to him with the monetary, monetary tranks, except he says this particular monetary tranks wants to restrict the supply of money. Uh, rather than uh, increase the supply of money. But nevertheless, he does say that uh, his marvellous acute insights into the nature of money is uh, more or less uh, ruined by the fact that he doesn't know any elementary economics. <laughs> so that's what, that's what I said about Rigel. But now, I, I did think when I read that, perhaps the you know, Libertarian Alliance shouldn't, because uh, you know, most of us have got, I mean, I've got a dream philosophy, not in economics. And uh, although I've got an A level in economics. Um, most of us uh, perhaps shouldn't uh, uh, play around with someone who's been uh, regarded as a monetary trank, but uh, I think this is a sort of risk. You know, this idea of trank is in itself part of the uh, providing disease. Uh, and I think the providing disease, which is perhaps uh, more uh, thought than any other disease, and reading through the books that I've been reading, especially Hayek's Denationalisation of Money, which I'm going to cover just in a little time ahead, um, is indeed apathy and boredom. And indeed the idea that some people are tranks so we didn't consider them, or indeed that there's the left wing and the right wing, and uh, instead of uh, having a look at what people's got to say, we can just say they're left wing or right wing, and then we know. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's enough. In other words, it's the lack of giving proper consideration uh, to uh, society. I mean, the main reason why I, I do happen to think that our ideas in the LA are uh, basically sound, uh, but, as we were saying in the spiel just before the talk began, uh, they lack social support. And uh, the main reason why they lack social support is because the vast majority of people are quite content with where things are. And uh, not only that, uh, it uh, they, uh, the average person knows one thing, and that is that religion and politics are terribly boring, and uh, you shouldn't go anywhere near them. And so, basically, on these two topics, they are, and indeed on many other topics, they are apathetic. And this means that they won't give any proper consideration to the problems that we want to give. We want them to give proper consideration to. And perhaps the number one weakness in uh, the proposal that I puts forward in the denationalisation of money, which is going to be my main topic, because as I say, Rigel is just another, well, he doesn't call it the denationalisation of money, but basically that's what he's, it is as well. Um, the main uh, weakness is that it does call for the general public to take a particular interest in uh, money. 
And uh, one wonders when you're reading through, and you might wonder when I'm covering it later on, uh, will the general public uh, reform their ways, not be as they are now, but take an interest in the workings of money? And uh, I think uh, uh, this might well be... I've, I've always thought that this is indeed a complete... A completely superficial problem, you know, being bored by religion and politics and being tremendously interested in religion and politics can be a matter of 10 minutes. Uh, if I may give uh, some anecdotes of my own personal experience on this, uh, uh, throughout the first uh, 14 years of my life, I had the idea that I believed in God uh, and uh, that I was a good Roman Catholic. Um, in my uh, 14th year, I um, did come across an atheist, actually, who was a bit older than me, he was 20. And um, I got into one or two conversations with him. And I took the conversation to uh, the, because I was still at school, I was still 14, I had a year or so to go to school. Um, uh, I took the, uh, what he said uh, to the religious instructor uh, at school, in the RI lesson, and uh, a man called Mr. Ozan. And I happened to um, fall on uh, fruitful ground because Ozan was uh, quite tolerant of, of criticism. Uh, and so uh, I put what this chap's name was, by the, by the 20 year old's name, was Vince Stetheridge. I happened to uh, put Vince's ideas to Ozan, and uh, then, of course, uh, Ozan uh, hammered them. And I took the hammering back to Vince, and Vince hammered them, and so I went as a go between. But what amazing, you know, the, the point of this anecdote is this. I, what had bored me stiff, and there's no doubt about it, they kept telling me that the churches were beautiful and the music was beautiful in Catholicism. I thought the music was bloody appalling and the dark dungeons, in, in contrast with the sunny outside, it struck to me that if you're going to call that beautiful, you're abusing the word beauty. You know, the, it's, it's probably dirty dark dungeons... But I've got to spend a bloody hour, most of it on my bloody knees, hurt, so my knee, kneecaps hurt. And this is what they call beauty, the beauty of the bloody service. And of course, it was all in Latin in those days, so, I'm old enough, so I didn't understand the bloody word of it anyway. And part of this emerging interest was that they told me one lot of, um, one lot of uh, stuff in Latin and another prayers in English, but of course I couldn't tell the difference between the two for most of the 14 years. <laughs> By the time I got to the age of 14, I started realising that virgin wasn't something to do with religion, but something that meant something in the external world. <laughs> and I also started thinking, Holy Ghost. I thought, bloody hell, that's a bit of an oxymoron, the Holy Ghost. But anyway, the point of this is that... Um, I became interested in religion, and I've never ceased to be interested in religion since. In other words, as soon as I thought it was false, I became interested in it. Now, this might not be a, this might not be a, a particular uh, uh, curiosity of myself. It might be. Uh, I, I might do a Hobbesian analysis of this. Well, you know, before I came across Karl Popper, who told me that uh, induction was a delusion and a fallacy. I used to think that the best way of analysing other people was what I used to call Hobbesian induction. It's exactly what Thomas Hobbes did and exactly what Sigmund Freud does. In fact, it was just uh, thinking that other people are like yourself. Now, this, of course, is not foolproof, but it's a good heuristic. You know, induction, or what people think is induction, of course, is not foolproof. It needs to be foolproof to be proper logic, of course. That's what's wrong with it. That's why it is a fallacy. But it's Hobbesian. Uh, there's another word for it. You can get rid of the word induction, we can call this Hobbes' automorphic analysis. Now, Hobbes' automorphic analysis is, in fact, uh, quite good. Uh, it, it, it gives you a good insight onto how other people might be. Not how they are, but how they might be. But you doubt it's just it, empathy. Pardon? But you doubted the existence of homosexuality on that basis. <laughs> uh, well, of course I doubted it. No, I didn't doubt, I didn't doubt, I didn't doubt the existence of homosexuality. Homosexuality, when, at this time, when I was about 14, frightened the living day out of me, because oh, they want to do to me what I want to do to women. <laughs> I don't mind doing it to women, but I don't want anyone to do it to me. That was my... And this is, and this is my explanation, which I almost got through. I almost got thrown off the other LA list for bringing this up, because I just thought this was homophobic. But, but, but anyway, they said you're homophobic and you've got no sympathy with the wonderful homophobic. I should point out our speaker was in a children's hospital for a while. So. Um, <laughs> 
Yes, indeed, and indeed, when I went into the shower, well, we're on homophobia, this is just so. Well, I went into the showers, because of the first time ever I went into showers, it was hard to stand up in the showers. But I also found something, I also found... <laughs> Don't do anything but stand up. I also found something tickling in my backside, and it was indeed an homosexual, who actually, unfortunately for the poor old dog, he was also a half cast, and, and, it, and it's the first time I ever heard the word wog. Because uh, 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 Jeffrey Bourne, his name was. Uh, actually, I shouldn't have said his name for Jeffrey Bourne. He might have sued me. What? If you happen to have access, if you happen to have access to the that? internet. But anyhow, this Jeffrey. Uh, uh, I better not go on about that because I'll get sued. I haven't got much money to. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so much for the prologue. <laughs> no, no. My point here, in all this anecdote, my point was that it's easy for apathy to turn into. Uh, well, my, uh, it's, it's easy for apathy to turn into interest. Now, I had a similar. Now, that was my experience with uh, religion. I had a similar experience to politics because throughout my teens, politics, uh, religion, I was interested in. I used to talk to the Jehovah's Witnesses and so on. Uh, I had a similar um, thing with uh, uh, politics that was boring. So I, I rejected one half of the common sense thing. Religion seemed to me to be interesting, but the other half. That politics was boring, I accepted it completely and utterly as an axiom. But then I, ca uh, I happened to come across, uh, I won't go into the complete story because it'd take too long, uh, but I happened to come across the SPGB uh, uh, and the uh, Socialist Party of Great Britain. The Socialist, Socialist Party of Great Britain. Great Britain. Uh, and uh, the, the speaker was Joe Chambers, and the second speaker was our common friend, David Steele. And. Um, a friend in common, I think. Right? A friend in common, common friend. <laughs> Uh, this is what, why Dickens went from mutual, and it's why Dickens made the solecism. But anyway, our common friend is quite right, although it is perhaps could be stated better. Yes. Um, and of course, then I, I uh, 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 became interested in socialism, and then of course I was interested in politics. So, this, in my experience, both the religious thing and the politics thing. Uh, the actual build-up from complete apathy to ignorance took, certainly in the religious thing, less than 10 minutes. And I think in the political thing, probably less than 10 minutes as well. So this is the, I think this is the major problem, uh, the reason why, if you like, why have the LA failed? Well, they failed because they haven't got any support. Why haven't they got any support? Because people are apathetic. So therefore... The fact that people are apathetic is the number one problem facing the LA, but it's also the number one problem facing the denationalisation of money. Uh, now, of course, there are, as we know here, uh, but as uh, some uh, viewers might not know, uh, there are a whole, a whole bunch of things wrong with current society. As I say, the vast majority of people, uh, even if they do suspect something's wrong with current uh, society, they hope that uh, it'll probably go away and it won't require their interest because it bores them stiff. Uh, now, uh, out of the things which are wrong with current society, uh, it's basically, I mean, common sense, current common sense, uh, has it that uh, the market is where you can get ripped off and the state is, can be trusted. Uh, sadly, that's current common sense. How have we got to that? Now, of course, there is a gap between what people say and uh, the sort of ideas that people act on, because there's a massive gap in human nature between uh, the use of language, which generally speaking uh, excludes any functional belief, and our normal tacit ideas, which include nearly all of our functional beliefs. So in actual fact, uh, if you uh, talk to almost anyone about the market, they'll give you a hostile verbal running down, which does not reflect their actual practical belief of the market. Their actual practical belief of the market actually uh, goes roughly by the common expression that I used to hear a lot in my teens and twenties. Fair enough. And it was always said about wages. Now, of course, they, everyone wanted better wages than they could get, but the wages that were going were fair enough. And that's the attitude of people vis-à-vis -vis the market, fair enough. He puts it into words, of course, but they, they think that tacitly. Now, in words, they may have a case against the market or something of a case, or they won't be too concerned with it anyway. As I said, they're mainly pass, uh, apathetic. Uh, but uh, the, uh, some of them the, uh, might have something of a, more of a case, uh, especially against the big firms like te uh, Tesco and Asda. They're ripping them off in some way. 
Uh, because uh, uh, Orwell quite rightly uh, summed up common sense in saying that uh, you know, common sense uh, always knows that two and two makes four, that sort of thing. In other words, it looks at things uh, in terms of, uh, of zero sum. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, exciting ideas, although Bob did think that this was uh, also an uh, also run idea, is one of the exciting ideas of liberalism and of economics, in fact, is that uh, the market is positive sum. Now, this means the market being positive sum means that the market, although we ought to be aware of the market, I mean, that's not, you know, that aspect of it is not wrong, uh, nevertheless, the market is a place where both sides can gain in transactions. And the market, and indeed, usually on, in trading transactions, both sides do gain. Whereas the state is the polar opposite of that. The state is where uh, is a, a negative sum, where both sides lose out. Uh, now, um, you know, to get a zero sum game, which people think uh, common sense tends to think uh, belongs to every uh, domain, you you really need to. Uh, have an artificial game like chess or tennis or something like that, that's where you mainly get the clear zero sum game. And even that, given that the two players are playing chess or playing tennis, it will be a positive sum game overall, given the interest of. So, so basically, uh, the market is usually, most uh, social relationships are usually positive sum. Uh, but um, our uh, interaction with the state is uh, negative sum. The state is a uh, uh, internecine. So, uh, the wonderful uh, philosopher Thomas Hobbes, uh, who's basically right on, on a lot of things he said, uh, got it catastrophically wrong on his main idea, because his main idea was uh, that uh, anarchy is a state of war of all against all. Uh, you know, Hobbes had a better definition of anarchy than that. Solitary, he, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. It would be it would be a war of war against all, where things would turn out to be solitary, poor, and life would turn out to be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Locke had a friend here. Uh, of course, Locke was a complete Hobbesist, but he did revise it uh, partly because Hobbes was so hated by everyone. He was such a bogeyman that he, he that encouraged uh, Locke to revise it. And all of uh, Locke's revision on uh, Hobbes were good. You know, we had a state of nature where you know, things are much better. But anyway, the catastrophic mistake that Hobbes made, which is at the heart of his philosophy, was that politics can cure this and bring about a toleration where we can all live and make progress. And we get rid of this nasty anarchy where uh, life is a war of all against all. Well, of course, the actual fact of the matter is that there is a war of all against all, and it is only the state and politics that introduces it to society. Most of the market society and the interactions in the face-to-face -face society is positive sum. Even, as I said just a few moments ago, even when we play tennis or chess, uh, although the game of tennis and chess itself is zero sum, the actual fact that we both want to play tennis or, uh, or chess is itself, uh, brings it as an overall, a positive sum. Now, um, so anarchy then uh, is uh, the domain which existed before the government, but also, uh, thankfully, uh, because people get this wrong, most people keep saying that the law is at the basis of society. Thank God that's not the case, uh, even though it doesn't exist. I still thank him. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, uh, if the law was at the basis of society, we would really be in, uh, in trouble. But, uh, but the law isn't the basis of society. Marx was right to say that it is economics which is at the basis of society, but what Marx overlooked in that was that this positive sum game is at the basis of society. So society is basically positive sum. But we have this internecine... Um, negative sum game, which is the state introduces. Now, what is the worst thing that the state does in all this? It does a lot of bad things in this internecine sense. The, probably the worst thing it does, which is high excess in the denationalisation of money, is that it retains the monopoly of the money supply, the monopoly of money. Now, the reform that Hayek wants to introduce and Weigel, uh, perhaps before him, uh, wanted to introduce, was uh, what well, I, of course, uh, thanks to Arthur Sheldon, suppose, the denationalisation of money. Uh, you know, in other words, he wants to get rid of this thing. And uh, uh, it, this 
denationalisation of money will cure many of the problems of state interference. It won't cure all of them. And Hayek, sadly, I mean, when I was reading through Hayek, old uh, Harold, Wilson, Harold Wilson came out with two good statements. One, he came out with the statement that the week is a long time in politics. He's right, he's right, perhaps he's back from... But another thing he came out with when he was having trouble with the Labour, uh, Labour rights was, he said, you are extreme moderates. <laughs> and uh, really through Hayek, I think, but the Alex is an extreme moderate. He will have the bloody state. And time and time again in this bloody pamphlet, the denationalisation of money, he keeps saying we have to allow for the state to make war. What? A classical liberal saying we have to allow for the state to make war. Why the hell is he a classical liberal? I mean, I, be, I, I became a member of the SPGP, I should have said earlier on, only because Marxism promised to solve the problem of war. I became disillusioned. I mean, I didn't look into, oddly enough, ironically, I didn't look into this um, promise of the solution to war. Of course, it's wriggled with holes and it's bloody hopeless, as, as the whole of Marxism is. But at least it had the promise of the you know, this. In fact, what, what, what uh, converted me to it was a, a watching of uh, that brilliant, a uh, watching of the brilliant film made, I think, in 1933 or 1936, of All Quiet on the Western Front which was a, a novel by a German called Remark. And this, uh, you now I watched this, uh, I was about 17 at the time I watched it, and uh, I remember I'd come, I'd come across some Trotskyists uh, just a few weeks earlier, and they came out, oddly enough, as Trotskyists sometimes do, they actually came out with pure socialism, or pure communism, as they call it, being that they accept Lenin and his distinction between socialism and communism. Uh, and uh, they actually uh, came out with this business of, oh, well, we don't have to go to work and so on and so forth. And I came out with a Lamarckian type thing, although I hadn't read Lamarck or Darwin. Although I got the book by Darwin, owing to my arguing with the Christians, they kept saying, you must, uh, you must you know, you're a Darwinist of some sort, that's why you reject Christianity. Of course, even to the, I'm now a Darwin enthusiast, but even to this day, I haven't been able to uh, find any of one of my uh, original objections to uh, religion, or even one of Vince's original objections to religion in Darwinism. It wasn't in Darwinism. I mean, Darwinism does have a case against religion, but it doesn't have the normal case that the average backward uh, man in the street will have against religion. But anyway, uh, um, now the, the point of that was uh, Darwinism. Uh, we arrived at money. Yeah, no, uh, get back to and the money. Yeah, I better get back to Ike and the money. I've forgotten the. Uh, I, I, I must confess that I've forgotten. I've forgotten the. Uh, the, the, the Oh yes, I was going to talk. Oh yes, I was. Sorry, I've, I've, I'll just finish this off completely and get back back to the money. Um, yes, I don't know why Hayek was a classical liberal if he didn't oppose the war. That I, I don't know. But uh, what I was going to say is uh, this: uh, I made the Lamarckian objection against religion. Uh, that uh, we wouldn't uh, uh, be a, uh, we wouldn't remain fit if we had this communism without uh, doing any work. You know, we all our muscles would decline and so on, and we would all and with all and the human race would probably die off because it wouldn't be. That's a Lamarckian thing rather than a Darwinian thing. So they had Darwin, they had Darwin on there, but they didn't they didn't exercise Darwin by the way. The Christians exercised Darwin. But anyway, uh, it, I was just going to say that even now I can't see any objection. You know, None of the main objections against religion are in Darwin. But, uh, yeah, so, but to get back to uh, the... the uh, I don't understand why Hayek uh, favours war or thinks that uh, the problem of defence... The problem of defence, even more than the monopoly of money, is a state-imposed problem. In other words, we only have the problem of external def uh, defence because we have external states. But anyhow, um, Hayek is rather tolerant of, of, of the need to have inflation or the need for the state to confiscate in order to fight wars. And that's quite remarkable that he has that, in the, uh, that, he has that thing. Uh, uh, most liberals, I think, would be absolutely opposed to that. But anyhow, um, I was going to say that Marxism is hopeless on the problem of war and the problem of mass unemployment, but the LA also promises to solve mass unemployment and the problem of war. And, um, the, of course, the... Uh, just on the problem of war, the free trade trades out war is the Cobdenite position on war. It was developed by Adam Smith to some extent, but it was developed by Joseph Priestley and other 
uh, intellectuals in the 18th century. And I think that that's basically the valid idea on war. But basically, we're talking about really, in this talk, the other problem that Marxism claimed to um, solve, which is the problem of mass unemployment, because the main motivation for Hayek publishing the denationalization of money was just that uh, many people had accused the market of having trade cycles. It was, of course, the uh, problem that Hayek was concerned with all his life, and Hayek himself had started as a socialist to some extent uh, you know, before he was converted by Mises to liberalism. And uh, he um, was worried about the fact that uh, the Marxists did claim that uh, uh, the trade cycle was intrinsic to the market. Now, if you read Hayek's earlier work, uh, two early works, Prices and Production is the second one, but Monetary Theory and the Trade Cycle is the first one, in both of those, uh, he reluctantly uh, agrees that uh, inherent in the problem of credit is this trade cycle. And he doesn't like it very much. But he thinks it's inherent in credit. Now, when he comes to the nationalisation of money, he realises that credit is not inherent to the... Uh, uh, the monopoly of credit, the monopoly of money is not inherent, in, uh, inherent to the market. So the idea of uh, competing currencies is to get rid of, uh, is to control, is to have a, a social control over credit. Now, as I mentioned, the market has a means of social control. This is, uh, you know, the status quo idea, as I said earlier on in this talk, gets things exactly wrong. They can uh, trust the state, but they hate the market. Now, they also, all, also think the market is unaccountable, but uh, democratic uh, voting and so on uh, keeps the politics complete, uh, politicians completely and utterly accountable. We have an election every five years, and we can have a little say there, and that keeps everyone completely and utterly accountable. They overlook the fact that whenever, and this, I, mean, I think Ricardo's, by the way, I think Ricardo's use of the word democracy for money was absolutely silly, because money is, even in its monopoly form, is far more efficient than voting could ever be. Uh, so even with uh, the uh, monopoly of money, which we've got now, the state issue money, nationalised money, in other words, we have a single uh, system of money owned by English money, German money, and so on. Uh, even with that, money, nationalised money, nevertheless gives us far more control over what's going on than the votes could ever do, uh, because we, uh, we, uh, the market still roughly works on this basis. Hayek, by, by repeatedly, uh, makes another mistake in the pamphlet, and he repeats it as part of his romantic outlook, because he, he was influenced greatly by Burke and by the romantics, and he, he was disillusioned by the Enlightenment, which he thought was the root of socialism. I think Hayek's completely wrong on that. You know, he, uh, and exactly wrong, uh, you know, because it is thinking, it is making things explicit, uh, that uh, helps us, uh, that it's not foolproof, of course, but it helps us to sort things out. Um, now, the reality, of course, is that even with nationalised money, money gives us far more control over what's going on than that voting or politics can ever do. Politics remains, thankfully, I did thank God earlier in this speech, at the periphery of society. Uh, because if it was in the middle of society, we would have the de facto war of all against all, which is politics, in society. But it's so much marginalised by the progress that's made on the market that most people, including my former self in 1968, who started re reading political textbooks, uh, when they read in political textbooks that government is about coercion, they think this is hyperbole, exaggeration. Of course, <laughs> we in this room know that it's not exaggeration. And indeed, the professors of politics knew that it wasn't exaggeration. So. Basically, what, Mar what Hayek's proposal is, because Hayek does understand that the market is a very good polycentric or anarchic means of control, uh, and that the government is uh, messing up the market for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but one of the reasons, although he isn't quite ex as explicit in this as he, could, as he could be, one of the reasons is democracy and all this is not a good means of control anyway. I probably doesn't realise that. But anyway, his proposal is right that we should denationalise money, get money away from the state onto the market, just so 
the market can control the supply of money. And um, this is the whole proposition. Of course, it's absolutely right. This is, and it's absolutely vital. It is the my friend Peter, who hasn't come today, who joins us sometimes on Sunday, quite rightly says to me, and I agree with him, that uh, the denationalisation of money, getting money out of the state's hands, is the number one thing that we need to do in order to stop the state from, and I always use this, but uh, in my own my emails I use this, from mocking society up. You could change it, let him, let him. <laughs> you could go to something else. But anyway, I don't, I just, uh, I'm basically a gentleman, although I perhaps shouldn't be. Almost. <laughs> I want to be a gentleman anyway, even if I'm not. And so therefore, <laughs> I, I, uh, I use this uh, word, mocking society up, and I don't use uh, ruder words. But, but anyway, uh, I don't even hint at them. Oh, well, no, no I'm not. Indeed. I, do, I do hint at them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so this is the... Um, this is the proposal, highest proposal adopted by Nigel Lawson, because Hayek has been a big influence on a whole bunch of people. One of them was Nigel Lawson. Lawson actually put it before the EU. That, and the proposal is this, that governments should keep their money supply, but they should allow all other governments, and especially in the EU at first, uh, Free circulation, so you, we have it within the EU, we have um, German mark. This is, this is before the euro came along. In fact, he was talking about, in the pamphlet, 1978, caused the euro, uh, 1976 was the first time we gave the talk in competing currencies. He caused the, the euro, which people were contemplating then, as utopian. He says, instead of your utopian demand, I have this one, which is going in the opposite direction. Uh, all the, uh, the states continue to produce their own money. You have that Deutschmark, which was not bad currency, <laughs> much better than the pound anyway. And you have uh, the franc and so on, uh, the lira and so on. Uh, let them um, circulate within the nations and tolerate banks issuing their own money as well. So you have competing currencies. So this is his proposal. You have competing currencies all the national currencies within the EU and perhaps with wider Europe if we can, and perhaps bringing in, he says, North America, you know, Canada and the United States later on and so on. It doesn't matter how many, you know, the more the merrier, really. Uh, any of these currencies can come in and, uh, you know, the big banks, Barclays, say, or, you know, Lloyds or something like that, to produce their money as well, and German banks and so on, Swiss banks, allow them to produce and allow these monies to circulate. Now, Hayek thinks that uh, what will happen, and I think he's right, roughly, is that uh, um, he thinks that uh, competing currencies will reverse Gresham's law. Uh, you know, Gresham's law is a, a law of uh, state money, which means that if you've got legal tender and uh, you people are obliged to accept the inflated state money, then bad money, owing to inflation, will drive out good. That's Gresham's law. You reverse that when you have competing uh, currencies because what you have is uh, uh, access to other currencies. So you can stipulate Mar Deutschmarks, I don't want pound, Deutschmarks, or you, Barclays is better, Barclays, I don't want Deutschmarks, I want Barclays, you can stipulate, and it can be the contract can be in any of these competing countries, or you could have a sub clause, or if any of these uh, issue uh, nations or banks that's issuing currencies uh, should inflate their supply or extend their money supply, then uh, I want the equivalent in perhaps one or two other supplies, you, know, you can name them. So you, you, so you can actually make a contract which allows for you a get out of inflation. So this reverses the old... I mean, what inflation does is it basically uh, benefits the uh, people who are in debt and it uh, robs the creditors. Uh, but Hayek is really on the ball on this because, of course, he spent his whole life uh, not only on the theory of money and credit, but also on the economic calculation argument, which uh, he's taken over from Mises against socialism. Uh, now, uh, he understands that um, inflation doesn't only um, 
benefit the uh, uh, debtors, the people who are in debt, and uh, penalise the creditors, and with the terrible long run running down of the capital base, which of course is the main reason why wages are increasing, is because there is a good capital base. I mean, the reason why we get more money in the United States than we get in Britain is because still, even now, the United States has got a better capital base than Britain. And the reason why Britain can pay more money even now than, although India is coming up pretty sharpish, uh, than uh, the, 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 while the Indian comes to England, it will get more money for doing almost anything in England than it will in, in uh, India. It's because still, even now, although India is coming up, uh, you know, in England has still got a better capital base. Now, what inflation does is it runs down that capital base, which, of course, means we're going back to the bloody caves with inflation uh, you know, slowly, but nevertheless, surely, that's the direction we're going in. Uh, so, uh, now, um, the, um, Hayek also understands, although he does not seem to understand it as clearly as perhaps he should, you know, me as an ex-socialist or Marxist communist, uh, being very much affected by the economic calculation argument, it was the thing that finished me as a Marxist. Uh, and made me into a, a liberal. You know, still wanting to solve the two big problems that are there to be solved, namely mass unemployment and the problem of war. So um, uh, he doesn't quite, he does see this clearly and repeatedly says it, but the main uh, bad effect of inflation on the economy isn't uh, just running down the capital base, which is god awful in, in itself. Uh, but the main problem is messing up economic calculation in society, messing up the market system as a functional economy. That is the main problem. Now, of course, this means, of course, but I, and this is what I doesn't see, and this is why it seems to me that he's a bit, still a bit. We're all, by the way, we are. All, I think, I think it is a fact. I think there is a fact, which is probably both facts are com contrary to common sense. One fact is that we're all confused. I think all of us, even the clearest sighted among remain certain, to a certain extent confused. A second fact is, I think, I mean, this I'm in favour with the rational, with the uh, economy. I think we're all rational. I think irrationality is a complete myth. We can argue that later on, perhaps after. Uh, but I think that irrationality is complete. We're all uh, rational. I, we all have a rationale for what we do. But, but uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, anyhow, Hayek does repeatedly admit that inflation gives some stimulus to the economy. Now, a stimulus usually is a correspondence, is a boost. If you want to say a stimulus could be the opposite of a boost, then perhaps that's okay. Perhaps it does stimulate the economy. Certainly it affects the economy. Uh, but if Hayek is right that the main problem of inflation is that it messes up economic calculation in society, then the whole idea of a, a boost by inflation is Codswallop. Now, I knows that it's Codswallop in the long run, so I want to suggest that if I was clearer minded, he would say it's Codswallop in the short run. But of course, there are three uh, phases of inflation. The first phase, uh, which is in the beginning, now, of course, the actual beginning of the current phase of inflation actually was in basically in 1914, when the British state, in this country anyway, when the British state came off the gold standard in order to inflate, in order to pay for the war. A thing, by the by, that I'm afraid mm. I would approve of. Oh, you silly boy, Frederick. Anyhow, he would approve of that. But, uh, but um, uh, and that was, and of course, they, uh, Churchill tried to get back onto the gold standard, and some economists, like uh, my beloved uh, uh, fellow Rabbi Cannon, uh, actually backed Churchill in coming on the gold standard, uh, but not many others did. Uh, and even Hayek thinks that it was a bit of a mistake, I think. But anyway, uh, uh, Cannon backed it, and one or two did, but not many. Uh, he, he tried to get back away from inflation onto the gold standard in 1924 or thereabouts. But anyway, ever since then we've had inflation. But anyhow, the first phase of inflation, as uh, is pointed out by Hayek, is that things aren't so bad, they don't look so bad. First of all, people have uh, the expectation of non-inflation, so they think that things are going to get back to normal prices sooner. Then uh, Hayek admits that there might be some slack in the economy after all, so there could be, there is the logical possibility that Keynes is right to, in the short run, and there are some idle resources, so perhaps it isn't so bad when it's putting those idle resources. 
But that's just the first phase of inflation. The second phase, of course, it becomes far more like, Hayek says, it becomes far more like what Friedman thinks it is, namely, uh, it goes to the David Hume thing, that uh, money is, uh, as, uh, is you know, double the money is supply, makes no difference, everyone just pays twice as much as before and we have the same sort of thing. Now, of course, Mises and Hayek reject that. Uh, money is not uniform in its effect on the economy. Uh, first of all, it diffuses throughout the economy, not instantaneously, but you know, the bankers have it first and so on. It goes out in circles to people. And, and this uh, distorts the economy. Uh, in fact, it messes you up money as economic calculation, which is the main distortion, as I have quite rightly says. Uh, so, um, uh, second phase of inflation. Oh, yes, sir. sorry. Thank you very much indeed, Fishin. Well, my mind isn't so pretty good, actually, I'm afraid to say. Uh, but anyway, uh, the second phase of inflation is roughly like Friedman has it, uh, the, which is the David Hume thing, the homogeneity. Certainly, it spreads out where people are... Uh, it isn't a uniform position, but it's affecting the whole of society and people are expecting uh, more inflation. And as they expect more inflation, so they counteract it. Uh, the third form of inflation, of course, is hyperinflation, where it really is hitting society with a vengeance, like it did in the 1920s in Germany. And uh, you know, there, you, you are really in trouble, and the capital base has been eroded pretty rapidly, and things are really bad. And of course, uh, you know, the thing which is hidden, which I has the merit of pointing out, uh, it's getting even harder to use the, uh, uh, the money supply to do economic calculation with. Uh, Hayek, by the way, and Mises, of course, both of them, uh, do not think, uh, in contradistinction to uh, uh, Fisher and um, uh, Milton Friedman, in contradistinction to them, they do not think that uh, uh, money can ever be totally and utterly stable. And Hayek actually does say, with his competing uh, currencies, that he thinks that uh, if, uh, deflation ought to be avoided as well as inflation, and he thinks that uh, it will pay the monetary firms, these various competing monetary firms, uh, they'll gain something, and society perhaps ought to let them gain this something, by even adding, which of course would be some inflation, I guess, uh, to the money supply, to their money supply, to, to maintain s uh, stable prices, uh, which uh, uh, Hayek thinks is uh, worth a bit of de facto inflation to do that. And he also, Hayek also admits that there might be some faults in this. He admits that a, a very popular... Uh, uh, money supply might get out of hand and need to its popularity might be, need to be reversed by the public. You see what, what the public would do. Uh, he does hope that the uh, Financial Times, certainly, and probably right with the Financial but also the ordinary press and perhaps the media and so on, will keep tabs on these competing currencies, not only the, all the national states, which to begin with, but by he does think, of course, you know, he, th he thinks he's putting a Trojan horse through here. Uh, or if you like the other analogy, the thin end of the wedge. He does think that by tolerating... Uh, you know, they're two different analogies. Uh, but they do, do the same thing. A Trojan horse has something inside it. And the thin end of the wedge means it's also more danger later on. Yes. So they're both... They're both uh, this, this is perfectly good English. I haven't studied the, the English books since 1968 for nothing. But anyhow... <laughs> the... the uh, uh, he does think... Not for nothing, but not for very much. Not for very much. Even, uh, every, 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 every comma has been uh, laboured over. But anyway, uh, he, he does think that letting the banks bring these will mean that it will be the private money that takes over from the national money before too long. Uh, so he thinks that... But he does think that the, these various, you know, the various uh, private monies... It could be any number of them. Um, we'll need to uh, keep prices stable, and they'll need to counter deflation. And he thinks it's worthwhile letting them have, letting us rip us off a little bit, perhaps. But he also uh, just to keep stable prices because uh, he thinks stability will be the chief thing that's wanted. Uh, and he also does think that uh, popular money could actually mess things up, not as nearly as bad as the state does now but could mess things up and get out of hand, in which case we will have to reject it for better money. So, and, of course, all of this involves the public taking a greater interest in this. 
Let's come back to what I was saying. A much greater interest is making demands on the public. I mean, the very fact of competing in the uh, currencies itself is, you know, right up front a pain in the neck. You don't want to all these... But that, you know, the fact that you're going to have to put up with different currencies and so on. But he does think that... Uh, he does think the laymen will uh, have a single currency in various areas. Not totally exclusive, but will have... A, and, of course, his problem in all this is, will the government tolerate all this? And uh, he keeps saying, and he even sometimes thinks his voice is insane, so he says, when we've tried competing currencies in the past, the government has soon stamped it out. <laughs> what are they going to do now in the future then? Yeah, obviously, in order to avoid all this, you've got to have that thing that we began at the beginning. You've got to have enthusiasm, public enthusiasm. We've got to get rid of the, the current main problem. In order to make competing currencies work, you've got to get rid of the current main problem, which has been before us all the time, and the main reason for our failure, which is public bloody apathy. We've got to get rid of public apathy. We've got to get pub people to take an interest in competing currencies and to make the system work. And with that, I'll hand it over for discussion. Very good. Hmm. Right. Oh. I didn't see you went first. Uh, furthest, <laughs> furthest first. <laughs> you said competing currencies might be viewed as a pain in the neck. I, I think you might as well say that competing makes of cars might be seen as a pain in the neck, or competing uh, a television set. But that's not a pain in the neck at all. People can very quickly adjust to it and, and value the fact that they can switch. Uh, well, I think that if you have... Uh, Competing currencies, you might want, uh, need to carry more than one currency, and that will be a bit of a pain in the neck. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you that, uh, uh, and I makes this point repeatedly throughout the pamphlet, um, uh, I think that it will settle down quickly to areas where there is, where most shops do trade in one, whether it's Barclays or anything else, or perhaps Deutschmark or, to begin with. I think certainly... Uh, uh, Ike also makes the point that people will be very slow to, to take this up, i.e. to go from, uh, uh, to go from uh, state money to private money. But I, I do think that uh, there will be local monopolies, as it were, but they won't be de facto monopolies at any time if the money supply starts paying up, which, of course, runs the risk that I mentioned earlier on, that uh, a, a, a favourite a, a favorite money might play us up the way the state does, but nowhere to the same extent. But yes, I think all in all, people will use one currency in areas, and I think all in all, they will quickly adjust it. But the very problem that they've got to look in the papers for this sort of thing, I think this will uh, impose some cost on people. You don't think so? Oh, it would be outside the supermarket. You look at it before you go in. You've mm. got some electronic gizmo that automatically tells you which is the best currency will, yes. today. In reverse order, as it were. Back from the back. Uh, many, many questions and comments. Uh, <laughs> just try to do one at a time. Okay, just a quick observation. I don't think at the moment there is any restriction at all on uh, competing currencies mm. in, in the sense that if you want, as a, uh, a shopkeeper, to choose to accept dollars, <coughs> then you're entirely free to do so. And if you want to offer to pay in dollars, then you're entirely free to do so. And I don't think there are any legal restrictions on that. And it's quite striking in those circumstances that uh, we only use sterling here. Which brings me on, on to my second point, uh, which is that uh, I, I disagree unusually with uh, Jan over there. Uh, there is a whole point of money. Uh, the whole point of money is that a bit like driving on the right or language, it, its great virtue is that we all use the same one. Mm. When we don't use the same one, we are partially reverting to barter, which is precisely what we want to avoid. We live in a world now where we have 225 different national currencies. Apparently that's a real pain. If you fly to Switzerland, as I did recently, and you pay a 20% conversion rate on your money, it, it's, it's, it's a real nuisance. So that's what we want to get away from. Competing currencies, it seems to me, is rather missing the point. The crucial element of what Hyatt proposes is, is, is not the competing currency bit, it's the denationalisation of the state's involvement. Once we take the state out of it, 
once we get rid of legal tender laws, once we stop the state producing its own money, you can pretty quickly bet that uh, the world, I suspect, will revert or will move to probably one kind of money very quickly. Now, just to make it clear, that doesn't mean only one bank. It doesn't mean only one kind of banknote. It doesn't mean only one kind of way of paying for things. But it does mean only one kind of money, one reference unit. Now, how you, how you deal with that reference unit, which banks you have, uh, is a completely different question. Of course, that should be the subject of as much competition as possible. But the money itself, the great virtue of money, is if there's any one kind of money. What do you say to that? Oh, well, I agree with your uh, idea that there's a bit of hassle in competing currencies, in uh, uh, you know, having to convert from pounds to francs or wherever it is that you're travelling. I agree with all that, which is what I thought Jan was disagreeing with. Uh, but I don't think that uh, you're right that... Uh, uh, I mean, I think, I think you are right to get in your main point that we have to get the state out of money. Uh, but I don't think you're right that we'll only have uh, one uh, money supply uh, and, and essentially one money. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we probably will have uh, competition of currencies. Uh, but, uh, you know... Uh, Why do you think that? Well, I think that uh, he, a particular... Uh, I think that... If you just have, I mean, how could you have just, uh, uh, are you saying that gold will be money? For example. Uh, yeah, well, yes, I mean, I, I, I'm sympathetic to that idea. Um, I'm sympathetic to that idea. That's one of the uh, disagreements I had with IAC. IAC actually thinks that uh, competing currencies can do better than gold. Now, he's willing to allow, of course, gold to compete. And um, he, th but he thinks that uh, finally, uh, I think he thinks that gold will be deflationary, and that deflation is a problem. And the competing cu currencies, by allowing the various private banks to inflate their money supply, as I described just a few moments ago in my talk, uh, that although they are gained by that, the payoff will be stable money, and this stable money will be better than gold. I think that's Hayek's line. Now, I, I tend to think that, um, I mean, uh, I tend to think that gold, whilst I think it will cause deflation, I tend to think that you could have a, uh, uh, if gold is at the background of money, in other words, if you have a situation where your money supplies are, com are translating into gold, I think that gold could uh, rise in price without the various monies that represent the gold rising. But in other words, you could have supply, say, say for example, we just kept the, the gold standard, or, or a source of gold standard, uh, but we had no, none of what I expect, I mean, we just had the various national monies. I think what you could do is you could have a rise in the value of gold, uh, and if, if, the, uh, if you had some really, uh, I, I tend to agree with I, you wouldn't get such uh, conscientious politicians, but say for example, you did have a world full of bloody absolutely conscientious politicians who wanted to maintain uh, the uh, money supply. I think you could have a situation where the gold ra rose in price uh, owing to uh, the efficiency of the economy, which I think is go going to generally, capitalism is so efficient that it is going to move towards deflation. Uh, and uh, you, know, you could have a situation where that gold rose far higher and what the government did is it just did actually devalue the money in, related, in relation to the gold, keeping the prices stable. And I think that's roughly what Ajax thinks that the competing currencies will do. He thinks that, the, the, yeah. but he does think that some of them will be rogues, as I said in my talk. He does think that some of them occasionally will be rogues. They'll go off and inflate a bit too much, in which case they'll have to be controlled by their rivals. Uh, so, you know, I think that if you don't have, uh, I mean, the way you could have compete, I mean, Hayek has proposed the competing uh, currencies. You know, these various firms, these various banks that supply money would not be supplying exactly the same money unless they, uh, you know, they're all translated to, to gold, I guess. The gold in itself is, I mean, it's, there, is, there is this problem that um, 
the Mises, uh, you know, when, when people first start me- reading Mises, it flummoxes them a bit. That, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, there is no constant prices. There is no constant value. It's all a flux. And uh, so you have some sort of problem with this, you know, nothing. Uh, you know, the economic calculation, I mean, m- many of my friends in, who remain socialists uh, were a bit flummoxed by this when I started saying that the economic calculation argument is just a rough and ready argument. In other words, we, we can economically calculate that. In a rough and ready thing, there's always some room for more <coughs> entrepreneurship to make inroads. You know, there's always leeway to, 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 to do better. It doesn't, it's not an exact thing, which is exactly what's wrong with the Fisher. Uh, Friedman thing, it makes the quantity theory too exact. And this is Mises and Hayek's and other people's criticism of it. We have another question here. Yes, I'm <clears throat> just following on, uh, on what uh, David has said, um, I, I agree with him that the nature of money is that it, it is universal. You want to be able to pay everywhere and, and therefore it's easier to pay in more or less a single currency uh, everywhere. So uh, you have a good example with credit cards. Um, there were a lot of credit cards. I remember 25 years ago and so on. Um, many have disappeared. Diners Club has disappeared. American Express has virtually disappeared here. Uh, you had Japanese credit cards, JCB or something. Yeah. You know, now you have MasterCard, Visa. Because it makes life easier. You don't need to carry all sorts of plastic cards and things like this, easier for the shops. And uh, so that, that is one thing. Now, as, as David has said, we, we have in Western Europe, the United States, the possibility of holding virtually any currency we want. There, is, there are no longer exchange controls. So you can have uh, your account in euros, you can have your account in dollars, you can have your account in yen or Swiss francs. You know, go to the bank, simply ask them to open an account in euros, they will do it. Um, And that says that there are two functions of money traditionally. One is payment, and the other is store value. So certainly, if you think of payment Maybe you could have, but I don't think it would exist, you could have small communities that would say, here we take only the, uh, you know, what, 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 ducats or, you know, uh, ducats or uh, doublons or uh, something like that. Um, but certainly as a store of value, uh, you would want to keep, you know, two or three currencies, no more. And that is what the world would be. I mean, you know, two or three currencies, competing currencies, maybe one would slowly disappear, um, but I, I don't see, but the market would naturally select these two or three currencies, one backed by gold, one backed maybe by a, a, a basket of commodities, you know, gold plus oil plus corn plus something else, you know, um, that's it. You don't need more than that. Yeah, I think I, I don't think I actually took, uh, wants um, you know, thousands of these competing currencies. Uh, it only wants is a, um, a, a a leeway out of monopoly money. He wants to yeah, dis- yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah, abolish, that's all he wants. <coughs> Pardon? Just abolish the monopoly. <coughs> yeah, just right. abolish the monopoly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's you would have an oligopoly. Yeah. <laughs> ah, well, yes. Right. Uh, no, we got here then, the monopoly. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say something to that. I think that that is actually wrong. I think you need competing currencies, mm-hmm. although, and I agree, you will always have like one or two, uh, a very sh- uh, small amount of, of currencies that are actually used by the by the vast majority of people at a time. But I think over time, this this fashion of which currency is used will change because. Once you have a fashionable currency, that currency will probably ma- be manipulated by someone and will lose its uh, face in the population. And then some, some uh, other currency that, is, uh, that was maybe um, not very popular at that time will come up and replace that. Mm-hmm. And to be able to replace that, you must have this re- re- uh, competing currency. And, and also, what you said about Visa, um, and credit cards in general. Credit card is not money. Credit card is a technology. It's to an use example. Money. 
And yeah, an example of making resource. things easy to pay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. But, but, so. but that is, that is the, um, why, why can't you have more current, uh, more, more, as, as you said, you can have currencies in every bank account, and I still have a bank account in euros, and I have, I have one in, in pounds, mm -hmm. and I could pay in euros in every shop in, 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 in London, basically, that, that accepts visa cards mm -hmm. um, immediately. And if the shopkeeper wants to have pounds at the end, he can, he can um, immediately, in, in real time, so to speak, transfer this, this money into pounds. But nevertheless, and pounds and euros are different currencies. Yeah. And, and in, in that sense, you, 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 it is very easy to have different currencies to, to compete with each other. And I would predict, although I agree that, that you will probably not have like thousands of currencies, that you will have a, a very small amount of it, you will always have to, at least a chance to change from one currency to another, uh, uh, because that, is, that, that, ha that has huge advantages. Do you want to come back? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Question from the back. There. I agree with that. I think as long as your currency is there, backed by gold, I think that's what the market would arrive at. A couple of points, actually. One is that you didn't really mention, but I think it's important. But of course, the state wants the central bank. Yes. Which can finance its spending. Yes. And oh, yes. Uh, as libertarians, this is, this is really important. I think, I think the friend, Bob's friend uh, mentioned this. And we, we've got plenty of examples, particularly at the moment, where the last, I think the last example of um, the uh, American print, printing of money, QE2, I think they call it, uh, the, the, the Fed was a massive purchaser of American government bonds. The biggest, it is now the biggest owner of American yes, government bonds, I believe, as, as exceeded uh, China. Yes. And this is what keeps the whole show on the road yes. in, in, in many countries. Well, I should have mentioned that here. Very I should have mentioned it because Hayek makes this point really up front, so I, I failed in. And, and, the, and the, the other point, which, which I just made any comment on, is the, um, the Fed is the central bank. I don't know why Hayek is against uh, deflation. Um, mm. In Britain in the 19th century, you had, uh, from 1822, Britain on the gold standard. And of course, with the gold standard, the, mon the money base stays uh, the same. But of course, production goes up. Yes, it is size is stable, and as a result, you get a slow and gradual deflation, which is what you got in Britain over the period between 1820 and 1914. This was no disaster. In fact, it was a, Britain was very prosperous then. And the, the the really good point about this is that when people save money in a deflationary era, mm -hmm. gradual deflation. By the way, I'm not talking about. Savage deflation, but gradual deflation, one two percent a year, which is what the gold standard would bring about. Uh, you you save say twenty thousand pounds. You know that in twenty years' time, that money will actually be worth more in terms of purchasing goods instead of the situation which we have at the moment, where savers know that pounds are a penny. Uh, the pound, the pound, the pound, pound has gone to a penny. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Yes, yes, that's perfectly correct. I agree with you, Stu. I, I can't see why he's so hit up a barrier for a deflation, but he is. He certainly is. Uh, but I was very negligent if I didn't put forward the idea that uh, the state financing itself uh, is very much uh, uh, the main concern of Hayek that he wants to put an end to the growth in public spending, the growth of what he calls, oddly enough, oddly for Hayek because he's so fussy about words. That he calls totalitarianism. Of course, what he means is, uh, you know, state power and so on, but totalitarianism is what we've got just lately with no smoking and, you know, i.e. interfering in little petty, you know, Bob's just taking his glasses off three times before the talk ends, you know, that sort of thing. They have a law against that, you know, that sort of, well, don't smoke and so That's totalitarianism, i.e. the state putting its fingers in every aspect of life. It's not just an almighty powerful state as what Hobbes, for example, recommended. Hobbes wasn't a totalitarian. But, Hobbes, but uh, Hayek uses the word totalitarian to mean what Hobbes would mean by a powerful state. In other words, he forgets that totalitarianism is interference in every aspect of life. Uh, but he, he nevertheless is against state power and against public services and so on because he thinks they're dysfunctional. He's quite right to think that. A question for myself first. Um, how would you respond to a Rothbardian, for example, who would say that competition in money could simply mean uh, competing 
uh, mines, obtaining the gold, competing coiners, competing mints, producing the gold. So we have competition between producers of money, but it's a common money. Yeah. Yes. This is the point. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, uh, Hayek rejects that. Uh, you know, he, he accuses Herbert Spencer of only recommending that and one or two others. So Hayek is definitely for competing currencies. He definitely rec yeah. uh, you know, rejects David and yeah. uh, Christian's point. Uh, I'm myself, I mean, I'm not wedded to Hayek, uh, you know, uh, you know like position here. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I pondered over what David and Mich uh, Christian said, uh, but uh, I don't know what time, what side I'll come down on. I don't know, it doesn't really matter anyway, I suppose. We're back then. Okay. I mean, first I'd like to agree about the idea that there will likely be some tiny number of dominant currencies. Uh, but it's the fact that the competition is there and is allowed that will keep them honest and sound. And uh, there's always the possibility that if you know, one of them goes wrong, the other one can replace it. And that's what's so good about the competition. I don't actually think it's going to be thousands of currencies. Oh. No, that, that, I don't know, that, that wouldn't be economic. But at, at the, on the periphery, at the margin, there's going to be a lot more. Uh, but people trading there will help to keep the ones that people, not, most people use uh, sounder. Yes. But uh, I have a more fundamental uh, propagandistic disagreement, which we've long um, disputed, which I think may go back to your SPG days, where you think that um, somehow we've got to sort of go, go around knocking on the doors of council flats and conversing people to these ideas. Um, I, I, People, when they see the market works, they'll go along with it. But we don't have to persuade them to the theory. There's a tiny number of intellectuals who have to be persuaded to the theory. Then the system will change, and everybody else will go along with it. Uh, and they will never have any kind of serious theoretical grasp of what they're going along with. They simply say, well, it's, we sort of understand, it sort of works. But the idea that uh, you've got a sort of libertarian theory is going to be spread, has to be spread across the um, popular firmament in any debt. I think it's, it's, it's a profound mistake. Elite propaganda is the right way to go. Well, uh, I'm not against elite propaganda, of course, and my own theory of propaganda is, is not exactly as it was in the SPGP days, which was certainly that you must convert every last hot and tot. Uh, to socialism. That was certainly the SPGB line, and I enthusiastically endorsed that for a long time. Uh, but after I left the SPGB in the 1970s, I came to my present uh, position, which is a bit similar to Hayek's, <laughs> except Hayek calls them intellectuals, and I call them extroverts. And that is uh, that you have to convert the extroverts. Now, uh, Hayek, uh, and people following Hayek, I mean, I think David Steele, my, our friend David Steele, see, our common friend David Steele, <laughs> thought that perhaps the colleges were good. I'm very disillusioned with the colleges. You know, it, it seems to me that uh, yeah, they're like feudal institutions where people go to, go to sleep in. Uh, uh, I do think that it is some of these ignorant extroverts that we see who uh, are probably, uh, who probably read, never read a book in their life they are the outspoken people, the people who make conversations at bus queues and so on. In actual fact, the society's effective voice, those who will be a minority, uh, those have got to be uh, uh, converted. Certainly, you don't... What you, I mean, the downside of the SPGB position is that you talk to these people who I said earlier on were apathetic. Uh, and, of course, you, if you talk to them, you'd just be wasting your time. It's like banging your head on a brick wall. You have to talk to the extroverts who are not apathetic. However, however, the main point I made at the beginning of the talk was something completely different. It wasn't to do with theory or converting people to become liberals. It was to do with, and this is a terrible problem, participation. I mean, one of the main... Uh, one of the main reasons why democracy has failed is because people hate participation. They don't just mildly dislike it, they hate it. One of the main reasons why we've got a firm, why we have the firm. In other words, let other people court for work and we'll just come in eight, uh, eight or six. Is because people hate participation. However, in order to make 
something like the denationalisation of money work, or in order to make a more, or even to get a more liberal society, we will have to cut back on that apathy a bit and have to have a bit more participation. Uh, we'll, we'll go back in a minute, but just just here first. There might be a, I mean, a, a response to that, David. Might be that you will get participation in the denationalisation of money simply by dint of the collapse of state money. Now, if that does happen, and there are some who think that it will, uh, they argue very persuasively, then people who don't think about it at all will, as they did in, in the Weimar Republic, find them themselves in a situation where they have no choice but to think about it because they're going to buy stuff otherwise because they're all added worth of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, my fear is this, that if we get to that event, and I think it's, it's a real possibility, uh, that what will then happen is what happened in Weimar Germany, which was that when the fiat money died in November 1923, it was replaced in December 1923 by fiat money. And they didn't go to gold or silver or to other quality money. They went back to the same damn thing that they had before, and nobody seemed to have learned anything. In the back? If you're going to convert extroverts yes. so that they talk to people in bus queues, the only effect of that is to put people off bus traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll bore them. We need journalists. People in terms of the radio, you know, there could have been at least some level of propaganda where people turn on because they're interested in what they have to say. Bus queues are just, you've got to go a bit higher than that. I agree with you that, that, that the propaganda, the, uh, the extroverts at the, at the bus queues bore people today. You know, in other words, <coughs> Extroverts do talk at bus schools and they do bore the heavy living daylights out of people. Yes, That's can. not going to change. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I want the message of the bloody extroverts to change. I want them to... You know, in other words, I am keen on converting people who are already interested. And they are, are not intellectuals, but they're extroverts. And uh, some of them have read books and some of them haven't. But anyway, they do a lot of speaking. And I want them to uh, parrot the, the liberal line. So it is extroverts. Uh, a lot of people will remain bored, but as I say, even those, uh, you know, I don't uh, propose we're going to get the whole population to become uh, explicit liberal up front, although I do think, and I always have thought, uh, that they're already tacitly liberal now. I mean, most people are live and let live and so on. You know, the, the thing that is, that is the, the requirements we need to maintain a market economy, most people have got it already. It's only the few extremists who are anti-liberal. Some of the experts, indeed. <laughs> Someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Make it quick, because there's a, a lot more. Yeah, OK. Um, I, I, was, I was just going to point out that, I mean, the, the idea of competing currencies, I mean, that, that, the way I see it, anyway, I mean, it's kind of striking a dagger at the heart of capitalism. Capitalism? Yeah, I, I, don't, think it, I don't think it would be worth, I don't think it would be acceptable. Crony capitalism. If you go back a, a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, actually, uh, in Cornwall, and they started printing their own Cornish money. And uh, they quickly got arrested and jailed, and the whole kaboom, the whole shebang was shut down, and money was burnt. The state simply won't allow it. Any state in the world won't allow that money, because it strikes right to the heart of capitalism. Rubbish, you could talk as currency, you won't keep currency. Pardon? Brixton Pound. Yes, it is. Yeah, I know about the Brixton Pound. I mean, I, I've, I've come across that at all, but even so, I mean, technically, it is actually still illegal. Um, I mean, they were talking in Ireland <coughs> a, a few years ago about, about having a limehouse pound. Um, but you could use it as a kind of gift voucher. If it ever it was suspected as being a rival currency to the state currency, you'd all be chucked in jail. There's no question, no no, question of that. One of the arguments, one of the, you look at all the, the capitalist countries and the, the massive crackdown on drugs, one of the arguments given for that, when you believe this or not, is that drugs, in a way, is, is on its way to being a competing currency, currency with, a, with, with the state currency. That's why it's, it, there's such a big crack. It's a better store of value, I should have but, thought. Yeah, <laughs> but the, the state, well, I mean, straight, straight in the hand of capitalism. Mm -hmm. If you go back, for example, the, the so called decimalization of money, uh, back in the 73, I think. It, well, it was an actual decimalization. Well, well I mean, decimization, possibly. Decimization, yeah, that's more <laughs> likely. But 
It was, I mean, I mean that was absolutely outrageous. I mean, as far as the working people was concerned, that was a cause of spell for war. And yet, the, the state simply uh, steamrolled everybody into it. There was nothing you could do about it. And that's Jump in. why yeah. well, it was this... be very, very difficult to get. I mean, they would have switched to another country. Was this, was this, I mean, you actually think that the state protects capitalism, and so it's worried about a, a, a strike at the heart of capitalism. What I would say, what I would say about a strike at the heart of capitalism, it would be a brute and foreman, it would be an ineffe ineffectual thunderbolt, because... What the economic calculation argument uh, taught me, although it didn't teach Mises who pushed it, is that there is no alternative to capitalism. So therefore then, opposing capitalism is a bit like opposing uh, uh, the need to uh, uh, refresh ourselves with oxygen every few uh, seconds. You know, it's just a, a futile activity. Yes. In other words, the challenge of communism is a, a non-challenge, so like the challenge of a gnat. Uh, to the heavyweight champion of the world. Yes, yeah, sorry, they may very put it wrong. I, I, I don't mean so much the, uh, the, the uh, challenge of capitalism, but I mean the control of organisations like like the masonry, the big financial institutions, uh, you know, maybe oh, lodges, crony capitalism. All the, all the, yes. I mean, everything which goes into those people that pull the levers. I mean, once you start uh, uh, having rival monopolies, you're going to start undercutting their power. Mm. Oh, you, you get rid of their power. I mean, yeah. that's the whole idea of I have to get rid of the central bank. It would be very, very difficult to do. I mean, there would be a war with them before that happens. How much, but what about the problem of taxation? Uh, it could be, I mean, the state always tells you what currency you can pay your taxes in. Actually, having said that, it might prefer to be paid in foreign currencies if they're depreciating at a slower yes. rate. So you might be allowed to pay your taxes in um, foreign currency, but it certainly wants to pay its bills in its own local currency. Mm. Yeah. It especially wants that, doesn't it? Yes. So you have to accept our money for payment for provisions for the army, yeah. for example. Both Ayak and Regal, who I didn't get around to talking to, I uh, apologise, uh, both of these are, because they both are limited, uh, free market, limited state, both of them are quite happy for the state to tax the new currency, in whatever currency the state, I mean, with Ayak, whatever currency the state sees fit. And in Regal, he's, he's bringing out his own special kind of like a money club, which he hopes will spring up spontaneously between traders and eventually come to rival uh, the uh, uh, nationalised money and eventually take over from it on a worldwide scale because it won't be limited to just the United States. Uh, it is kind of like a little trading club. Uh, people have said it's a bit like the Let's. Well, I don't think it is less because it's less are trading the barter right now in goods, whereas this legal thing is for an actual sort of money uh, where you join a kind of like a money club and he hopes this money club will expand to gradually get bigger and bigger and so it gets bigger than the, the national currency and gets bigger than perhaps uh, many kind of uh, spreads abroad and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but both of them are, uh, both Regal and Hayek, are happy for the state to uh, raise taxes in their special currencies. Ah, oh, well, sorry, I respond really to, to your point. Uh, compulsory national fiat currencies are not there to enable taxation to take place. They are there as a substitute for taxation. Yes. Because there are only two ways that the state ultimately can raise money. One is by printing it and one is by taking it. Yeah. And it's very often com more convenient to print it than to take it. Oh, there are limits on how much you can take. Just a, a, a response to, again, to your concern, David, about the fact that money and central banks are boring. I think one of Ron Paul's greatest achievements is he's actually made the American central bank an interesting subject. <laughs> oh, to you? No, no, uh, not just to, to me, Americans, not many of them. To a lot of Americans. He's actually got... Is Ron Paul, is Ron, I mean, is Ron Paul bigger than Goldwater was? Uh, will will yes, Ron Paul be, be a, a factor in the next general election? Yes. Do, uh, how many people in the United States of America have heard of Ron Paul? My guess is that well, most of them have not. I think probably most of them have by now. Most, have most of them have been eating in all the polls. Well, I doubt it. But still, you might be right. When, when they he's going to be leading in straw polls in, in all states uh, for the Republican candidacy. And he even beat Obama in, in a national poll. Um, he, he, he's obviously not going to win. But, no, but, no, but, but, but the people know is, about him. And he has reached the, the level that. No Republican candidate can actually unlimitedly support the Fed. The Fed is an issue in the, in the primary debate for that. And they, well, they all try to say, well, we want to audit it now. 
because obviously they, they are for for big governments, most candidates. But there there is a there is a uh, but he has made it an issue, and, and no one can be completely for the Fed at the moment if you are a Republican in, in this primary debate. Mm -hmm. That's a huge achievement. Yes, it is indeed. Yeah. Although the financial crisis, so called, has made money interesting. Yes, in the first place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, indeed, I mean, yes. it's, 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 it's not by chance that the German people are a bit down on inflation. It's not, that not, not that the good theories came along and told them it was a bad idea. I was going to recommend you to read. This is actually lived through it. Like, like, like but you know, uh, on, yeah. the housing boom and bust by Thomas Sowell. Uh, it's, it's, um, um, you know, it's, it's not as you know, it's not profound, but it's good. It's well worth reading. Profoundly good. <laughs> I mean, Bob's point is absolutely key, which is that we are actually now entering a time where money is going to become interesting to everybody. Well, I, I wish you were right, but. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I do remain a bit sceptical about that. But, you know, it, it could happen. I mean, we don't know how, as I said at the beginning of the talk, we don't know how profound or fixed this apathy is. It looks like a superficial it's thing, but it might not be. curse. May you live in interesting, interesting times. Time. Yes, yes. There was, um, of course, Diocletian brought in uh, price controls when he debased... Uh, the but he was a military man, wasn't he? Uh, it was the emperor. Clueless uh, on uh, economics. He, he, you know, I think there might, it shows that the state will handle different uh, currencies when it's used in this little example. But he debased the currency, brought in price controls, uh, said certain people couldn't change their occupation and such like. So although most people under that region were given the uh, debased currencies, uh, the legions were fading <laughs> those old. Yes. Uh, sorry. Yes, that's true. Well, I think that about yeah, does it, doesn't why, it? Why, uh, oh. You know the old occupation of Wall Street? Nearly. <laughs> or, or, or occupation of Wall Street, OWS? Oh, I know, yes. How come it hasn't happened here in the city of London then? I mean, it's, it's empty in the city of London. Where is everybody if, if as many is so interested? I mean, uh, just youngsters here, there's some students here like them in zombies, aren't they? They don't seem to be interested. Mm. The Americans do. They don't seem to be interested here. Any comment? No comment on that. Very good. You made me speechless. <laughs> well, thank you, David. It was a pretty interesting uh, talk. Eventually.